So one recurring theme I've witnessed in the LoRa and Helium communities has to do with antennas. Specifically, which ones are the best for extending range and improving rewards on the Helium network? For those of you who are new to my channel, much of the theory, at least with respect to power, line loss, and gain, is covered in the first chapter of my LoRa at ZeroCraft playlist. Having said that, the extensive catalog of commercial options can be a little intimidating for someone who's new to radio, including myself. Along those lines, many non-radio engineers fall back on antenna DBI as the best measure of an antenna's performance. For this reason, it doesn't hurt to briefly summarize what exactly DBI means when considering a commercial antenna purchase, and then set up an experiment to see if it really makes that much of a difference. So briefly, DBI is a measure of the forward gain of an antenna, or the gain in power emitted by an antenna relative to an isotropic emitter. I've seen gain range from 2 to 12 for commercial antennas tuned to LoRa or Helium network frequencies. However, nothing is free in that antennas with greater gain do so at the expense of diminished radiated energy in other directions. These are some examples of graphics I've found on the web that make this case. For this reason, if you don't intend to point your antenna in a particular direction, then you may not want a lot of gain since an increase in horizontal coverage comes at the expense of losing coverage in the vertical direction. Conceptually, let's look at how these dynamics can impact the number of witnesses associated with my own installation located in the Tucson mountains. For this thought experiment, let's assume that path loss from interfering buildings or vegetation is not an issue. Let's assume this is the radiation pattern associated with a low DBI antenna. You can see here that the pattern captures a bunch of witnesses in the valley, but misses a few in the foothills of the Catalinas to the east. Since helium relies on witnesses to earn rewards, my initial instinct might be to increase the gain of my antenna in order to capture more witnesses located farther away. By increasing my gain, I may in fact capture a few witnesses located farther away in the Catalina foothills. However, given the local topography, this improvement in range comes at the expense of lowering my total number of witnesses. Now what happens if I move my gateway further down into the valley? Here's my conceptual baseline condition showing generally pretty good coverage. And this is what things might look like with an increased gain. Given this location and distribution of available witnesses, increasing DBI in this case might make a positive difference. Now what happens if I move my gateway to the foothills on the other side of the valley? Here, improving DBI might have a positive impact given the distribution of existing witnesses. But upon doing so, the improvement may be marginal in that I'll capture witnesses that are farther away at the expense of those that are closer. In fact, I have a colleague who shared details regarding lost coverage as a result of increasing gain from 3 to 13 dBi, as summarized in his text here. Here, you can see that this particular gateway was realizing 44 witnesses with a simple antenna yielding a gain of only 3 dBi. And when the gain was increased to 13, the number of witnesses decreased by 35%. Given the impact that topography can have on coverage, the website Radio Mobile lets you predict expected coverage as a function of antenna location, elevation, input power, line loss, and yes, antenna DBI, but without consideration of path losses that might result from buildings and vegetation. This is a screenshot of the expected coverage of our ZeroCraft LoRa gateway as summarized in a prior video. For my own installation, my Helium hotspot is hosting a quarter wave ground plane antenna in the foothills of the Tucson Mountains with a pretty good view of the valley. This antenna is built from readily available parts you can pick up at your local hardware store as summarized in a prior chapter of this channel. If you'd like to learn more about how to build one of these from scratch, I recommend these two videos for your consideration, the links of which I'll include in the description of this video. This ground plane antenna works great for LoRa applications as evidenced by data published by the Helium Network, 
indicating my gateway is being witnessed by others located up to 43 kilometers away. In fact, it's the availability of this data that attracted me to Helium to begin with, and that it provides me with the unique opportunity to realize some interesting experiments. One experiment I'm sure many of you have tried is to evaluate the increase in earnings from swapping out an antenna, perhaps a low DBI antenna for one with higher gain. Will the added investment make a difference? In order to test this for my own installation, I need to know the DBI of my homebrew antenna in order to establish a baseline and compare it with a commercial 5.8 dBi antenna purchased from Rack. However, since my antenna hosted on my gateway was built by me, I don't have a commercial spec sheet I could refer to for my baseline comparison. Complicating matters, an internet search yielded a wide range of possibilities of gain for a ground plane quarter wave antenna ranging from about negative 0.85 to 5.31 dBi. Upon reviewing these online forums, it quickly became clear that in order to get a legitimate answer, I'd likely have to learn a modeling program to best approximate my own antenna's dBi. Fortunately for me, the YouTuber Mobilefish has already done some modeling for a homebrew quarter wave ground plane antenna using the freely available modeling software for NEC2. Mobilefish was kind enough to even include a 4NEC2 input file for quarter wave ground plane antennas that can be modified for my own particular build. As a first step for modeling my own antenna, I went ahead and downloaded his input file and tried reproducing his results using the 4NEC2 software. This helped me understand how to run the software, and I was able to generate results that were very close to what was reported by Mobilefish, or at least close enough for my purposes. Unlike the antenna modeled by Mobilefish, my own antenna tunes to a lower frequency of 915 MHz in line with regulatory requirements here in the U.S. This will result in different antenna dimensions relative to the antenna modeled by Mobilefish who lives in the Netherlands, which licenses LoRa at a frequency of 868 MHz. In response, I modified the input parameters for the original 4NEC2 input file shared by Mobilefish so that it matched the design of my own antenna based on the model for 915 MHz. In the software, I also set the transmitted frequency to 915 MHz as required for my region. These modifications yielded a max DBI of 3.14 for my own homebrew antenna. Great, I now have a baseline to work with. Having said this, I should make it clear that I'm not a radio engineer, nor have I studied the 132-page manual for the associated modeling software. Instead, I'm relying on modifications to an input file for NEC2 developed by someone that's clearly smarter than me in these matters. As a check, my modeled results suggest a maximum gain of 3.14 dBi, which puts me right around the middle of what's predicted for ground plane antennas in general. So for now, I'll assume 3.14 is a reasonable approximation for my own antenna, and thus a good baseline for my experiment. As a side note, and for those of you who might be interested in reviewing or modifying the associated NEC2 input file, I've included a link in the description of this video. Of course, I'm extending a heartfelt thanks to Mobilefish who produced the original file from which my own modifications were derived. So here's the baseline data for my 3.14 dBi antenna serving a Synchrobit hotspot. You can see here that my daily earnings maxed at 0.391 helium tokens on February 27th. My hotspot yielded a minimum 0.169 tokens on March 8th and produced 0.287 helium tokens on the last day before I replaced my antenna. The average daily earnings came in at 0.265 for mining that occurred during a 30-day period between the end of February and the end of March. The Helium Explorer API is certainly helpful for reporting these metrics, but I wanted to see if I could find a different app that would allow me to download data as a text file so that I could then analyze it using a statistical program. 
I searched the community tools and found this Helium Board app that was recently published. The app has a nice interface that does provide a little more insight into data, but unfortunately does not allow me to download daily records as I had hoped. In addition, the Helium Board app reports daily earnings that are slightly different from what I recorded using the Helium Explorer app, but they're not really that much different. Moving on, the Helium Explorer app provided me with another baseline statistic, specifically the number of witnesses encountered over the last five days, which totaled 67, while also showing me a nice map of both the distribution and farthest witness pinged by my hotspot. I would have liked to have seen what was reported for the last 30 days to compare with my earnings. In this regards, the Helium Board app does provide a nice daily distribution of witnesses encountered over the last 30 days. Having this data made me wonder, are the number of witnesses correlated to earnings? Well, the Helium Board app does provide a nice daily summary of earnings that are in the ballpark of what's reported by the Helium Explorer app. So I came back to the valid witness chart and superimposed the daily earnings chart. This yielded an interesting result in that earnings do not appear to be directly correlated to the number of witnesses. Perhaps this has something to do with the quality of witnesses I'm encountering with my hotspot. To further evaluate this, I can pivot back to the transmit scale maps hosted by Helium Explorer. Here you can see that many, if not most, of my witnesses have relatively lower transmit scales, which directly impacts earnings. For those of you not familiar with transmit scales, it essentially diminishes your earnings for witnesses that are encountered in areas that have a higher density of hotspots, as summarized in this clip. The Helium Board application captures this result nicely in this graphic, which shows that 43% of my witnesses have poor transmit scales, whereas only 19% have good transmit scales. Bringing all this home, I can study this map in the Helium Explorer app that shows most of my witnesses are located in the valley where transmit scales are relatively low. With the higher DBI antenna, I would hope coverage is extended to these areas, which host hotspots that have a relatively higher transmit scale and thus will improve earnings. So by using these applications, I can now come up with some baseline data for my hotspot installation that hosts a 3dBi antenna. Based on the last 30 days, my hotspot yielded an average 0.265 helium tokens per day. In addition, I managed 67 witnesses over the last five days, with the majority of those witnesses hosting mediocre or poor transmit scales. That last point is important as it relates to the poor correlation between the number of witnesses and my daily earnings, and that maybe it's not quantity, but quality of witnesses that matters. So over the next few slides, I'll talk about how I went about uh, swapping antennas for the proposed experiment. So next I'll just briefly explain how I'm going to mount this uh, antenna on my roof. So if uh, you watched one of my prior videos, you noted that um, I had a uh, four inch um, uh, piece of uh, sewer pipe mounted on one of my roof tiles vertically. And then I used this uh, four inch uh, end cap uh, to uh, basically mount my antennas. And this has a one and three eighths inch hole drilled in it that allows me to basically slip a uh, one inch piece of PVC and with the two uh, uh, slip fittings, I can basically anchor the, uh, the antenna on this, uh, on this end cap, which is gonna mount on that four inch um, PVC that's mounted on my roof tile. If I were to remove this, that's basically what I'm dealing with right there. And that seems to work pretty well. It seems to be pretty sturdy. I don't think this is gonna move in the wind too much. And then I can feed my, uh, uh, my antenna cable through that little hole right there. So before I swap this out, uh, I'm gonna have to unplug the synchro bit um, to shut off power. I definitely do not want this powered on when I'm doing the antenna swap uh, because when the antenna is disconnected, that little synchro bit's gonna be putting out a lot of power to the antenna and it's all gonna get reflected back. It's gonna 
uh, potentially uh, heat the, uh, the synchro bit and destroy it. So always make sure that you shut down these, uh, these gateways before you do any uh, maintenance on the antenna. One thing I don't like about these synchro bits is there's no proper way to shut down the synchro bit. Um, there's no shutdown protocol. I can't SSH into this thing and tell it to shut down. The only way to do it is basically to unplug it, which uh, just doesn't sit well with me, but it is what it is. So I'm going to come down here and the synchro bit is now unplugged. And now I can safely replace the antenna without um, damaging the synchro bit. All right, so the next thing I need to do is climb up onto my roof and replace that little ground plane antenna that's up there. I can see a morning duck checking it out uh, with the uh, Rack 5.8 dBi antenna. And this is just to kind of give you a general idea of the view from where that antenna is located. So I'm up on my roof and one thing I can notice uh, from this vantage point is uh, that little uh, sewer pipe is no longer vertical. So we've had a lot of wind over the last few months and I can see that that kind of skewed the, uh, the direction of that antenna. And that may be the reason why uh, my, uh, my witnesses and my earnings have decreased over the last couple weeks. All right, I'm uh, up on the roof, taking a look at the level on this uh, little antenna, and you can see that things are pretty skewed, which uh, would certainly bias my visibility of the valley. All right, so the, uh, the antenna has been removed. I can see a little bit of um, oxidation on this connector, but overall it's, it's holding up pretty well. So I had to come back downstairs because I've got a male end coming out of the uh, rack antenna and a male end coming out of the cable. So uh, luckily I had one of these in stock, so I'll be able to uh, uh, make that connection. All right, so I got that little adapter on the end of my uh, cable, and that should help me mate with the bottom of the rack antenna. And you can see here that the cable is uh, uh, mated with the rack antenna. Okay, and the antenna is uh, mounted on the 4-inch PVC and end cap. And you can see that the shim that I was using to level things out is kind of weathered. Uh, this was just balsa wood, so not the greatest material to uh, to be using for uh, you know for an application like this that needs to be weather resistant. Uh, it's what I had at the time. I'm gonna have to improve on this, but uh, this might explain why things were a little out of level when I came up here. All right, you can see now that things are pretty level. Here's my antenna. You can see I have a good view of the valley. So the witness that's, uh, that's coming in at about 40 kilometers is out in that direction over there, which just blows me away. But uh, you can see that uh, that the view is pretty good from up on, on this roof. And I think that that really makes the case for line of sight, probably being the best thing you can do if you're interested in telemetry range, or in the case of helium and in increasing your earnings. Um, I think that's more important than antenna DBI. We'll, we'll see if I'm right uh, after this experiment, but certainly line of sight uh, is a big plus, I think, in these experiments. All right, folks, the uh, Rack 5.8 DBI antenna is mounted on my roof. Here's all my leftover parts. All right, now that the antenna is plugged back in, I guess it's safe to plug in the sinker bit. See if we can get this done. There we go. There it goes. So the synchro bit was offline for about an hour while I uh, made all these adjustments. So I'm assuming it's gonna take a little bit of time to sync with the blockchain once again. Uh, let's see how long that takes. 
And it's been about 20 minutes. Um, I came back to check up on this thing and as you can see, it's already synced to the blockchain and working normally. So uh, having it down for about an hour didn't really uh, impact uh, the time required for it to come back online. In conclusion, it will be interesting to see what the next 30 days yield in regards to witnesses and earnings. With the increased antenna gain, maybe the number of witnesses will increase, but my overall earnings will remain static or decrease. Or maybe the reverse will happen in that my total number of witnesses will decrease, but I'll be pinging sites with better transmit scales such that my earnings will increase. Only time will tell, and for those of you who want to track progress on this experiment, I'll include a link to my Helium Explorer stats in the description of this video. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I'll continue uh, generating a little bit more content on Helium, uh, but I do hope to return to the Arduino stuff pretty soon. I miss playing with that. So uh, subscribe for updates and uh, give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Thanks. Bye-bye.